Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of a trumpet. Praise Him with the sultry harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with stringing instruments and organs. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals. Praise Him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Some of you remember this sermon or not. I felt like I should revisit it this morning. It's been fairly recent, so it may sound familiar, but for some reason I feel led to speak it this morning. So we're going to preach that sermon. Don't waste your waiting. Don't waste your waiting. Say that again. Some of you need to hear that. Get that in your spirit before we get going. Don't waste your waiting. I know some of you have so much patience. Don't waste your waiting. Please turn with me to the book of Habakkuk. To the book of Habakkuk 2, chapter 2, 1 through 3. Chapter 2, 1 through 3. Brother Tim, I believe you're in the wrong spot here, buddy. <laughs> I bet your online audience says, I don't know who Brother Tim is, but I feel bad for that. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you, sir. That's okay. That's all right. You got to remember live, right? Mm -hmm. If it can't happen, it's going to happen. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am approved. And the Lord answered me, and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables. Tables are writing apparatuses or papyrus as they would use. That he may run that readeth it. Verse number three says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry. Though it tarry. You can leave it right there for a few minutes, Brother Tim. So, what Habakkuk is saying is God has a work and a vision for his church to do, for people to do, but it's yet for an appointed time. In other words, it's not going to come to pass for a while. You're going to have to do some waiting. And I know that as humans, if there's anything that we share in common, it's our disdain for waiting. We don't like to wait, do we? Think of the things you must wait for. Pregnancy. You wait for dinner. You wait for Christmas Day. A lot of your life is spent waiting, isn't it? Stoplights. Traffic. Now, I know some of you really struggle with that. Stop lights, traffic. Why is the speed limit 25 for here? It should be 85 for here. Some of y'all are going to do that anyway. Parents, wait for school to start. Our kids are homeschooled, so we can't, we can't claim that one. Families wait for a vacation day. <laughs> They know hard of waiting and waiting to go to the mountains and waiting to go to the beach and waiting to go on a camping trip. We hate waiting, don't we? Especially when good things are coming our way. We don't like to wait. Waiting is hard. The longer we have to wait, the harder it becomes. But in reality, waiting builds certain aspects of our character. Even so, most people hate waiting. We live in a society where waiting is intolerant. 
We live in a society where there's instant gratification and we have eliminated the, week, the need to wait. Can I say this real quick? Having everything you want ain't always good. Mm -hmm. The ability to get anything you want anytime you want it is not always good for us. Sometimes it's good to have lack in your life. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe some of you would appreciate where you're at more if you had to go back to eating a hamburger heifer without the hamburger for a week or two. You ever, you ever been there? Anybody ever been there? Hamburger heifer without the, without the hamburger. Fried, fried bologna, you close your eyes and wish it was a T-bone. <laughs> Have you ever been there? We live on fast food for those of us that can still afford to go out to eat. A family of four costs you about $100 now. Seems like, depending on where you go. We have movies on demand. I want to watch it. Hit the button, bam. It's there. Um, I heard somebody say one time, if they ever hit it big and get a lot of money, they're going to empty their Amazon shopping cart. <laughs> For those of you that shop Amazon. You know, you have your dream list in there, you know. Yeah, you got that, you got that Amazon shopping cart. You know, but, but in reality... <coughs> In reality, you can get an Amazon charge card, which I strongly discourage. And with one click of the button, you see the red card, bam, it'll be your half out of bar. Matter of fact, if you're like me, if I really want something, if I'm searching for something, and it says it'll be next week, I go with another brand so I can get it tomorrow. <laughs> y'all don't know, y'all don't do stuff like that. Y'all just, just wait the whole week. No, if I, can, if I can get the same thing, they look a little bit different tomorrow. I, I, I'll go ahead and do it to get, get it tomorrow. <coughs> you got lightning fast internet. You can shop with one click of the finger. You get it instantly. All these things pull at the fabric of our society. And they stem from an unwillingness to wait. Think about all your appliances in the house. I'm hungry. I want something to cook the food fast. That's why we got gas stove. When we moved into our home, we paid extra money, had a gas stove, gas line involved, installed. When I, when I cook sausage, I want sausage quick. Gas, gas will get it done. Gas, you don't get a mix of the heat up is instantly, instantly hot. Let me quit messing with you all this morning. But think about all your appliances in your house, don't it? I want this fast. I want this done now. In actuality, the things that we do on the outside reflect who we are as humans on the inside. We don't want to wait on that. Spiritually, it's the same thing. We have a problem with God. And we begin to accuse God. When we don't get what we want from God, when we want it, how we want it. See, some of y'all do the Amazon prayer. I'm praying about this and I'm going to hit the want button. I'm going to hit the sin button. And that prayer better be answered by the Lord. You better remember who you serve. Amen. And you better remember He's worthy of respect. Amen. And glory and honor yeah. and who are we to be anything yeah. in the world? Yeah. Right. The problem with waiting in reality, this team, is we don't have all the details. The vision is set is yet for an appointed time. God is doing something, and I can't see what He's doing, so I become intolerant and I become impatient. Everything on the inside of me wants it now. I need it now. I want it now. In reality, you step back and take a breath and know that God has set the vision for an appointed time, the work for an appointed time, but you got to give God time to work the things out that you can't see. Somebody better give God Amen. some praise there. All right. God rarely does anything in our time frame, and because of this, we can get easily discouraged. My ministry... It's not going quick enough. I'm not getting ordained quick enough. I'm not studying quick enough. I need more. I need more. I need more. In the Gospels, we see this happening with Mary and Martha, don't we? You've heard me say this several times. Jesus is in another city, another county, another place, and Lazarus, his good friend, has passed away or is passing away. And they clearly sent to Jesus to come and help, but Jesus does not come. As a matter of fact, he waits around on purpose. You don't come to the wake. You don't come to the family night. You don't bring food. You don't bring nothing to drink. What did you do with somebody in your family 
important past and your preacher didn't even come to the wake. He didn't even come to the family time. He didn't even come to the funeral. He didn't even come to the funeral. But he was waiting on purpose. Let me tell you something about God. God arises precisely when he wants to, when he needs to. Amen. And even death cannot yes. hold back the will of God. But he does show us. A wise person once said the following. Waiting for God means power to do nothing except them a command. If you can learn that in your life before you leave this world. By the way, me and Reverend Rex, Reverend Rex and I were rather talking about this all the time. Ain't nobody leaving here alive unless the rapture taking place. Ain't none of us getting out of here alive. All of us will have to taste the sting. Of, well, not the sting of death, but because Jesus is a the sting of death. That's right. Amen. Out of Amen. Amen. It means power to do nothing except them a command. This is not a lack of power to do anything. It just means you're waiting on God to give you the instruction because in the end it's going to speak. Waiting for God needs strength rather than weakness. It's power to do nothing. Did you know it takes more restraint to do nothing Amen. than it does to rush out and do anything? <clears throat> Let me put it to you this way. Pass around these Proverbs. You ready? It is a strength that holds strength in check. It is like the mighty stallion is strong and able to run at high speeds and gallop at high speeds. But the power needs to be harnessed, so you put a harness on him. And you're able to regulate that power, regulate that horsepower, regulate that speed. Like the Colorado River is powerful, untamed. But humans, under the, under the direction of God, so we can subdue the earth, right? We can do whatever we want to with the earth, right? So what God gave us a talent to do. We need to harness that untamed power so they built the mighty dam. And the dam takes that which is strong and powerful and mighty and restrains it to use it for strength and for electricity and for good. Mm -hmm. Waiting is strength under control. It's good to be powerful. It's good to be strong in the Lord. But you need to channel that strength and use that strength for the glory of God at the appointed time. You understand what I'm saying? Can I do the witness? God loves you so much that He is willing to hold something forth from you until the perfect time. I never forget when Sister Shannon and I were at Green Acres, it was hard to wait. All my friends were full-time pastors, full-time evangelists, or they were doing some kind of missionary work overseas, and I felt lesser. Until I came to the point, I said, okay, I'll be an associate pastor for the rest of my life. I'll serve the next pastor that comes in. If he don't stay there, I'll serve the next pastor that comes in. If he don't stay there, I'll serve the next pastor that comes in. If you want me to be an associate pastor, whatever it is you want me to do, I'll spill toilets in the church. I'll, I'll sell everything I got. Move to the whatever. Move to the Congo. Whatever you want me to do, I will wait. And I bet you wait too much later. I got the call to come here. You see, don't waste your waiting. While I was waiting, God was conditioning us. Right? While we were waiting, God was preparing us. I'm telling you right now, nothing can prepare you for full time ministry. I'm gonna tell you that right now. Let me tell you this, another pastor runs Proverbs before we get into the, the two more, before we get into the meat of the sermon. One reason many people never see God working in their lives is because they never hang in there long enough for God to show his power. I'm waiting for God to do this thing in my life, but you won't be faithful long enough for God to do it. In other words, God, I'm going to do this great thing in your life, but you won't be disciplined long enough, stay in one place long enough. We had a gentleman that came here one time. He wanted to be ordained as soon as he walked through the door. I said, I'm not going to ordain you. I don't know what you believe about Trinity. I don't know what you believe about salvation. I don't know what you believe about sanctification. I don't know what you believe about the rapture. I don't know what you believe about revelation. You're going to have to be trained. You're going to have, I'm going to have to know. Unless I know you well, and you come to the middle of church like Reverend Roy and Rana did. Unless I know your ministry, know what you believe. I'm not going to ordain you. He'll around about two more months after that. But people aren't willing to wait. And in the end, Brother Tim, they go somewhere and they get hurt and they get dejected because they weren't prepared properly. How many of you know God is a God of preparation? Amen. 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 Your ministry of what God calls you to do will never be more powerful or greater than your preparation. 
If you think about Jesus and his youth, you only got little tiny glimpses. You get his birth. You get a couple of years there. When he was 12, what happened between 2 years old and 12 years old? Since a large gap there. The next thing you know, he, he's preaching his ministry and he's, and he's 33 years old. Almost two decades passed and are gone. I can tell you what he was doing. God was preparing him and getting him ready. Don't, don't, don't knock and wait and, and, and ask for opportunity. Be ready for opportunity. That's what waiting on God does. It prepares you for the opportunity. When the opportunity comes, you'll be prepared. You'll be ready. Can I get a witness? But you got to hang in there long enough for God to make a difference in your life. And remember, can I say this about growth while we're here? Your growth is not uniform. Quit comparing your growth chart to everybody else's growth chart. This ain't like a physical doctor's office or a physical growth chart. I'm not on the physical growth chart, as you can tell. Your growth is not uniform. You might grow fast for a couple of months, and then you might hold up for a couple of months, and then you might be stunted for a little while. But it's all in the way. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you this. Sometimes when you're waiting for God to speak, He's waiting on you to listen. Amen. Amen. So in this particular sermon, I would like to introduce five things. Some of you may remember this, and some of you may not. I would like to introduce five things to remember while you're waiting on the Lord. So you make sure you don't waste your waiting. I may not get to all five, Brother Tim. I know I'm not going to get to all five. If I can get through two, I think we'll be accomplished what God wants us to accomplish today. But at least, let's at least list them. Don't you think? So you can remember them or write them down. Describe a down note, scribe this down. Or make a note in your Bible where on a timeline this sermon was so you can go to that minute and that second. So I'm trying to say, those of you that are tech savvy, at least a little bit. So number one of the five, this is what you do while, while you're waiting, and this is what you need to remember while you're waiting. Obey the last thing God told you to do. That's number one. Obey the last thing God told you to do. Number two, don't make an Ishmael out of impatience. Let me say that again. Don't make an Ishmael out of impatience. Number three, maintain your relationship with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Number four, some of you to hear this, rest while you are waiting. Rest is important. You need to rest your mind. I've been reading this book called Replenish. And it's mostly for pastors and senior pastors and ministers and associate pastors. But it's still good. He, he calls it the method retreat in advance. I don't care how good a shape you're in. No pastor can be on the front line day after day after the battle of ministry. Day after day after day after day. There has to come a point where you retreat. Get your mind together. And then you engage the battle again. Right? So rest. While you are waiting. And number five, pray. While you are waiting. Don't forget to pray. So number one, obey the last thing God called you to do or told you to do. Psalm 37 and 34 records it this way. Wait on the Lord and keep his way. And he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off. Thou shalt see it. So notice the wording of the song is here. While you wait, keep his ways. While you are waiting, continue to do what you have been called to do until the new assignment comes forward. Amen. Amen. Wait on the Lord and keep his way. Don't stray. Stay on the path of God. Stay where God calls you to be. Listen Amen. to me. Amen. People get aggravated with people because we're humans and we're messy. Yes, you are. Don't you shake your neck and head knowing me. Yes, you are. You're a mess. And I am too. If you don't think you're a mess, then you're, you're, a, worse mess, you're a worse mess than me. Just because God has promised you a blessing, a new season, or some type of transition in your life, you must keep doing the last thing God told you to do until the vision begins to execute in your life. Amen. Amen. Let me give you an example. 
I'm still obeying the last thing God told me to do for almost 17 years. This year, I will be here 17 years come Father's Day. I'm still obeying the last thing God told me to do. And by the way, he hadn't told me to do nothing else. I'm to stay here until God speaks otherwise. Let me give you this. Don't go outside the boundaries of your assignment while you're awaiting. Stay in the middle. Stay where God... Remember that sermon Reverend Rex preached one time? Stay in your lane. Stay in the boundaries of your assignment. Stop straying over here and trying to give answers over here. This is what makes soothsaying and psychics and horoscopes and all these things. That's why those things are such a big sin to God. Yes, that is a sin. This is what you're doing. I'm going to read my horoscope today. And it's going to guide me and direct me throughout my... This is what's going to happen in my day today. So if you depend on that rather than the wisdom of God. Amen. That's what makes up astrology. Now, it's okay to study astrology, but we don't read stars to try to get our future. Stars don't know my future. Christ knows my future. Amen. Remember the Nehemiah anointing. I keep bringing that up from time to time. Two of you. Thank you. Thank you. I need to preach that series of sermons again. Three of you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you remember the anointing, the Nehemiah anointing is defined as a divine enablement to do, to otherwise do something that you are not capable of doing. Nehemiah was a cupbearer. And a man of influence and a man of words. Um, he was an academician, you could say. But then all of a sudden, he's a construction worker. He's telling men how to lay stone. In other words, while you're waiting on God, God is setting up great things for you to do. You just need to know when that time comes, when the waiting period is over, God can supernaturally empower you to do something you never could do. Come on, somebody. Amen. Keep operating until that time comes. Keep operating in your assignment. You have been assigned to this church, some of you. Some of you have been assigned to be a musician. You've been assigned to be a sound person. You've been assigned. That's why you never look down on somebody else or compare your ministry to theirs because their assignment is different than your assignment. Amen. And you Amen. can't complete your assignment always looking at somebody else's assignment and critiquing theirs. Amen. Somebody say amen there. Amen. Amen. Remember, you had to wait on God at some point to get where you're at now. <laughs> to get where you're at now, some of you waited excruciatingly. What is God doing in my life now? Where am I going now? What am I going to do now? Trust God. That's what you do. You maintain. Do the last thing you were told to do until a new command comes forward. When God placed you where you are, this too was a divine assignment. You got to remember, you are on a divine assignment now. Obey and do the last thing God told you to do. Can I get a witness one more time? Yes. Listen, you can't stop operating in your assignment because you are waiting on God. If God starts speaking to you and says, I got, I got this other thing for you to do, you're going to transition? That don't mean stop doing what you're doing now. You complete what you're doing now until God moves you or transitions you into that place because you're not ready to be transitioned to that place yet. The futile effort in your current assignment will carry over into your new one. This is critical. I got this down here. It's critical. God will now allow you to move into a new season of calling if there are spiritual bad habits in your current position. Come on. Some of you are in a waiting pattern or reciprocal pattern because you got unrepentant sin in your life. Because you got sharp edges in certain areas of your life that God is trying to get at. You got a bad prayer life. You got poor study life. Again, unrepentant sins. You got a bad attitude where you are. You are grumbling where you are. Listen, if you grumble in your desert, you will grumble in the promised land. Come on. Amen. Let me say that again. If you are grumbling in the desert, you will grumble in the promised land. Some of you, when you get to where God wants you to be next, I'm not talking about another church necessarily.
necessarily, though that could be in some of your futures. Who knows? I'm not the kind of pastor that gets mad when somebody says, I feel led to go somewhere else. If I know you're spirit-filled, and I know you prayed hard about it, I know you waited on God, and God has legitimately moved you, so don't, don't be angry with them. They're trying to do what God has called them to do. Somebody say amen. 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 <laughs> in other words, once you get to your new assignment, once you are done with your transition, you're not going to have time to have bad prayer habits. You're going to have to pray and get it done. You're not going to have time to have bad study habits. You're going to have to step up and get it done. You're not going to have time to be involved in this sin. And you got to move, baby. Can I get a witness? you got to leave these things behind. The greatest joy in serving the Lord comes when you know you're at your assignment in life and you're operating in it. I have never felt more contentment in my life in my life than where I am now. I didn't say complacent. And content don't mean complacent. Content means I'm content. I know for a fact I'm where God has called me to be. How many of you know that for a fact you're in the place that God wants you to be? Amen. If you're not, no wonder you're miserable. No wonder you're hard to get along with. No wonder you're bitter about things. No wonder you're not working to your full capacity. Is anybody still awake out there? You still listening Amen. to me? Amen. You haven't left the bill on your head yet. When you're at your assignment fulfilling your purpose, you feel peace. And you don't fight against God. You get away from your purpose and you become miserable and you begin to stray. Listen, when we don't do things God's way in our life and we neglect our, His purpose in our life, everything you do will put your hand, to, everything you put your hand to, you'll fail. Now, Shannon can tell you, I ain't gonna lie. I don't want us to shake nobody. Up. Sometimes we get approached by other churches. And I was approached by a church not too long ago, and they said, The church is already twice the size of yours. Everything is all you got to do is go out and preach and visit. That's all you got to do. And I said, Well, there's a problem with that. And then they said, What? I said, Well, if I go to that church, it's gonna fail. They said, why? I said, because I'm not called to go to that church. I'm called to be the church I'm at now. If I go to your church, God's hand will not anoint me. I won't be the preacher that I am here. Can I get a witness? Amen. Money can't fix it. Bigger church can't fix it. It's about being in your assignment. It's about obeying the last thing God told you to do until God Amen. changes it. Somebody give God some Amen. grace there. Amen. You listen to me. Everything you do will turn to mud if you get outside of your calling and your purpose. So brother Tim number two, don't make an Ishmael out of impatience. Number one, do obey the last thing God told you to do. Number two, don't make an Ishmael out of impatience. When we get spiritually impatient, we produce spiritual Ishmaels. What does that mean? We try to rush and get ahead of God and do things we're not supposed to do. God told Abram and Sarai, or Abraham and Sarah, you're going to have a son, but you're not going to have the son whenever you think you're going to have the son. It's going to take some time. I told him, like, in his age. Some of y'all almost had a stroke, right? I mean, a heart attack right there. <laughs> Excuse me. Or, yeah. Some of y'all say, a baby in my setting, a baby. Could you imagine Abraham and Sarah? When Sarah's finally present, or pregnant with Isaac, they're going through the grocery store and they're getting pampers, <laughs> baby food, and they're in their eighties. I can hear their friends. No, you got grandchildren. Ain't that cute? You find nothing for my baby. Look, I got a baby. I got a baby. <laughs> <laughs> got a baby on the way. Of course, they had Ishmael first. Did you know? Because Abraham was a man that couldn't wait and Sarah was a woman that couldn't wait. The result of their impatience has caused conflict for all these millennia. Did you know that's why they're fighting in Israel now? It's really Isaac versus Ishmael. Amen. You're not going to solve the conflict in Iraq and Iran and Syria and Turkey and Israel with bombs. Obama wiped them off the face of the man. Somehow these people, they come right back. They go in some hole somewhere and they come right back. This is 
a spiritual war. Muhammad said, I got, I got news for, the, for, 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 my Islam, for my Islam friends. Islam didn't come until five or six hundred years after the ascension of Jesus Christ. How can he even... Come on. I ain't got time to get into Islam. I, mean, I, I can teach a series of sermons on Islam if you want me to. It has to be on Wednesday night. Uh-oh. 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 We do still have church on Wednesday night, by the way. Amen. I just, I just want to throw that out there while I was here. We, we do. Okay. But but look at the but look at the repercussion because he couldn't wait. Don't waste your way. Can I get a witness? Amen. Amen. When we act out of impatience, we block the miracles and blessings God has been creating for us. The miracle was Isaac, not Ishmael. The promise was supposed to go to Isaac, not Ishmael. Now, Ishmael was still made a mighty uh, nation mm-hmm. only because God favored Abraham. I got, I got a powerful message I'm preparing for, for Wednesday night. Contentment and tribulation. Mm. Contentment and tribulation. I'm going to be preaching about Joseph. If God wills, if that's, if that's the Holy Ghost's will. Let me say that again. When we act out of impatience, we block the miracles and blessings God has been preparing or creating for us. There are few or no sins greater that are committed more often, is a better way to put that, than unbelief and impatience. Some of you are saints until you have to wait on something. Some of you are saints until you pray about something and you hit the sin button and God don't answer right then. Then you become angry with God. And this is what happens. Since God won't fix it, I'll fix it. And then God's got to fix the mess that you made and then fix you. And then you're back on track to be where you're supposed to be in the beginning. So why not just wait? Amen. It's okay to stop. And say, God has something good for me. And it's worth the wait. I, can I speak to all of our young people? Our two young people are in here. Three. Yes, ma'am. Three, our three young people that are in here. Everybody in here, right? No, not everybody in here. No, not everybody in here. If we got young people watching wherever you're at, it's worth it to wait on the right boy or the right girl. Can I get a witness? Amen. I tell my girl all the time, if he won't bow his knee to Christ, then he shouldn't bow his knee to you to give you a ring. That's right. How about that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but if he's ugly on the inside, Amen. and he's going to treat you rough, That's right. and talk to you rough, then he's ugly. Amen. Can I get a witness? Amen. Amen. All right. I'm going to marry somebody ugly. What about I'm going to be on? Huh? That's why nobody won't be involved with me all the time. She ain't married ugly. All right? She, that's why she don't worry about me at 2 or 3 o'clock. I'm going to know why I'm going to be Let me quit. Let me stop. It's just... This is what happened. Can I preach this for another minute or two before I let you go? Okay, Are you sure? sure? Sarah believed in God's sovereignty over the womb, but then she acted against it. Right? This is what happened when we, this is what happened when, when we become impatient. We believe, we believe that God is over the womb and we believe that the child's going to come when you say it's going to come. But all of a sudden, when God don't do the way we want to do it, we jump in there and make a mess and we break things and we get in God's way. That's what they did. Oh, you're the God of, you're the, you're, you're the God of our ancestors. You're the God of split the, that's what we pray now. You're the God of split the Red Sea. You're the God that rolled back joy. You're the God that raised Lazarus from the dead after four days. While you're praying about something, when God don't come through, yeah, God did that then. He don't do it now. 
And we start making excuses why God don't do it. Let me tell you something. God can do anything He wants to do. Amen. It's just when He wants to do it. Can I get a witness? And I get He can't do it. He just hasn't done it yet. Listen to me. Whatever some of you have been waiting on, it's not that God can't do it, Brother Steve. He just hadn't done it yet. Amen. But He can do it. And He will do it. Amen. Amen. I hope this is helping somebody. Mm -hmm. It's okay to preach a sermon you preach before. But it's kind of rare, very rare. I would say the first time since I've been here, I preach a sermon is close. Matter of fact, I preach a sermon in October. That's how close the sermon is. Some of you get like you've never heard it before. I must have had like five people here that night. It was on a Wednesday night, by the way. <laughs> That's why it seems so fresh. Yeah. Brother Rick said, don't look at me. You start going. <laughs> at first we can believe the blessing when it's spoken. I got called to preach right now, 378, right by the old flea market. Believe it or not, this is gonna blow you, this is gonna blow you kind of costumes away. Angels didn't show up. Michael or Gabriel himself didn't show up. Jesus Christ himself didn't appear and sit beside me. I didn't, the sky didn't open, I didn't hear trumpets. A, a sweet praying you will preach on round the road. But I had no clue it would be a whole 10 years later before I arrived here. That's why I've been a preacher 27 years now. Shows my age on it. At first, we can believe for the blessing when it's first spoken, then as time lapses, we become full of unbelief. And then we try to help God through our impatience. Help God. I'm definitely not going to get to three, four, or five, right? Unless you want me to. No, no yeses in the house. Preach on. No, ah, you better be glad you up there, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I see the mater is coming out. <laughs> Listen, impatience fuels and feeds the flesh. When you become impatient, it's real easy to drift into sin. God won't take care of the bill. I'll find another way to pay it. I'm going to cheat here. I'll let this slide here. It's, it's tax time, right? <laughs> Impatience. You want to get you want to get into sin quick. Remember, don't make a dish smell out of impatience. If you want to get into sin quick, you start getting impatient, and you'll find yourself swerving and drifting, and find yourself in messes you don't want to be in. Brother Tim, you, you, can you pull up Romans eight and five? For they that are after the flesh. Do mind the things of the flesh. And that is what the flesh is, impatience. That's the work of the flesh. God says, I'm going to do it, but you don't believe God no more, so you get in the flesh. The word in the Greek is sarx. Sarx. S-A-R-X. I can't put the, 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 the accent on it. It's a short word. It means that that is untamable. That's what the flesh means. That don't, they don't go by no law. It can't be tamed. You don't like to be tamed, and you're not going to tame it. Some of y'all need to understand that. That you're struggling with control, you're struggling with your flesh. Well, let me tell you something. You're not going to control the flesh because the flesh does not want to be controlled. The only thing that can beat that, the power of the flesh, is the power of the Holy Ghost. Can I get a witness? The long wait for the promise discouraged Abraham and Sarah and it made them vulnerable to acting in the flesh. Did you know even, even after they slipped up in the flesh and had Ishmael, it was still 13 years. So even though they got impatient, got into sin, got in the flesh, God said, you still got to wait a lot of time. I was going to make you wait anyway. You still got to, you still got to pull the 13 years. So why, why not just wait? Can I get a witness? Come on, I've got to close up. Listen, when, when we become flesh-driven,
driven. The flesh drives our destiny. Can I say that again? When you become flesh driven, flesh begins to drive your destiny. You're no longer in control of the car. One of the, one of the most faithful things I've ever had to do was the first time I sat in the back seat and let Jessica drive. <laughs> not, it's not Jessica the bad driver. She did good on the way to church. My heart only palpitated twice. <laughs> no, Jessica, Jessica's a great driver. Oh, have mercy. Bless her heart. She's a great driver. You know what's hard to be a Christian? Is sit back and watch God drive the vehicle. You don't got no brake. You don't got no steering wheel. You don't have nothing. I'm not going to call his name, but occasionally I go fishing with a good friend. Yep. Your eyes went to the right block, so you don't say that. And he don't like to drive slow. <laughs> when, we, when we're on our way, when we're on our way to the hill, and it's been hot, and, he, and he's ready to go home. He's always ready to go home. And uh, so, you know, Probably the boat was too big for the boat anyway, but we got to go in. And, and uh, oh, oh, man, we, we fish in the river a lot, and the sandbars. And I turn around, look at him, and I said, remember now, I, I, no, no brake or no, no, no steering wheel up front now. Look up under that limb. Sandbar, I'm going to throw me out that way. I was already, I was already contemplating how I'm going to hit the water. <laughs> the boy gets not coming up a boy. But, <clears throat> but it, sometimes ride with the Lord the same way. You're, you're riding down this river of life, and sometimes it's fast. Sometimes you can't control it. You ain't got no brake, you ain't got no steering wheel. Sometimes you just got to take a breath and say, I trust. Who's driving the boat? Right? Trust. <laughs> Go fish all the way back to land, I guess. <laughs> but in reality, by walking in the flesh, we become dependent. Give us a song of invitation, ready, brother. We become dependent on your own wisdom. That's what you're doing. When you refuse to wait, when you're waiting, you're waiting. You become dependent on your own wisdom. Listen to me. The worst thing that can happen to a preacher is to get up here and forget who the real star of the show is. Amen. Amen. Can we get a witness? The real star of the show is not me. You know, in the Western world we live, the wedding's all about the bride. The bride comes in, thousands of balls on the dress, depending on your budget, everything's done. It, the, 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 the groom is just, he's just a pawn. He's just filling the spot. <laughs> Matter of fact, I, 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 love, I love to do weddings. The spiritual significance of weddings is awesome. Awesome. I love to do weddings. And the food's always good. <laughs> I did a real fancy wedding twice last year. To two, I did a bunch of weddings last year, but one of them had all you could eat prime rib and all you could eat the Snow King snow crab legs. They're kind of like you see on the, the crab end where they try to use lobsters and stuff. And man, let me tell you something. I'm like, man, praise the Lord. Let's have some perks. <laughs> but I felt so bad for the groom one time. He comes in, he's standing over there, and he's just waiting on me to get this thing on. I said, so we walk, we walk in there together. From the side, we don't get to come down the aisle. The groom got to come from some strange exit, some some strange entrance from another place. Then the bride, but you know, in the Bible, it's obvious. the groom gets all the glory. See, we're just the bride; he's the groom. Come on, somebody, give the groom some praise. Preachers are just wedding planners. That's all we are. Those that are ministers in here, youth, laymen, deacons, don't forget, he's the real star of the show. Amen. Can I get a witness one more time? Yes. Look what happens. Preachers become dependent on their own wisdom. We become dependent on self. We begin to act as independent little gods over our own life. I'm the God of my own life. Now remember, he's the God over all, and at his name, every knee shall. And every knee should. 
Somebody get a Go ahead and place a song, brother. Anybody wants to come and pray, you can begin to make your way down. You can pray right there in your seat, whatever you want to do. But I want you to notice the catastrophe that happens because Abraham and Sarah wouldn't wait on the Lord. You know, it's one thing if a husband gets out of God's will, but when a husband and a wife commit spiritual mutiny on the Lord, the whole family crashes. Amen. The whole family crashes. Amen. It's important, isn't it? For mom and daddy to be together. Mm -hmm. For mom and daddy to be together. Go ahead, brother. Hallelujah. Don't waste your waiting. Waiting is a crucial part of your Christianity. Learning how